I can't say anything but thank you. What a joy. I tell you what, Father's Day is so special, and children are the things that make it that way. Kind of, and I was thinking, proof positive of that, if his child was not on stage with him, Levi would have just looked silly doing that, you know? <laughs> but you get to do it with a child beside you, and all of a sudden, the rules are completely rewritten. It's a wide open door. So there's, there's a spiritual lesson there somewhere, but I'm not sure what it is. Turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Kind of making our way through this great book that talks to us about this outlandish faith, this faith that is rather revolutionary and radical, this faith that is not necessarily comfortable or easy, a faith, though, that makes an impact in this world uh, for God's kingdom. As you're turning to that, I do want to just uh, remind you that you have one more day to be able to fill out one of those cards. Pass this, or this is in the bulletin last week. It's uh, there available for you again if you haven't done it yet. These are your three words. Three words that describe your experience of faith. The first word is the idea of before I met Christ. One word that describes that. One word that gives us a chance to paint a picture. One word that says before I met Christ. One word that talks about when you met Christ where you were, what was going on, what you were feeling, who was with you, but one word. One word that says when you met Christ. And then one word that's kind of that launching pad, kind of that, that summary, that way to be able to say something about it, that one word that talks about after you met Christ. So before you met Christ, when you met Christ, after you met Christ. Go ahead and fill, if you haven't done that yet, many of you already have, Fill that out and uh, do fill out both cards, and then you go ahead and you tear that off. One you keep in your Bible with you, and one you go ahead and keep in your in your seat, not in your pew. You go ahead and just put it in your seat upside down, and and those will be collected. And then we're hopefully we'll see if the artistic vision finds its way to reality. We're going to be able to do some things with that and and see what that looks like. So uh, keep. Keep hold of those three words and consider those wonderful things. Have you ever noticed that we live in a world, and we like living in this world, a world of us versus them? There's a, and, and we go ahead and say this is us, and this is them. We go ahead and we use talk about political parties. It is the Democrats versus the Republicans. We follow that along with our colleges, and it becomes the Sooners and the Cowboys. We have not experienced football season yet as pastor and people through college football. I, hopefully we can get our relationship stronger before we have to endure those moments together, right? We like to be an us versus them when it comes to the Sooners and the Cowboys, and although everybody's agreed we're against Texas. So... We all, have, yeah, we all have our wonderful things to be able to think about there. We have an us versus them mentality sometimes in our nationalities. We have an us versus them mentality even when things entertain us. Matter of fact, one of the basic principles of any storytelling is that there has to be a villain. There has to be an antagonist. There has to be something that has gone wrong. Because after all, it's not much of a story if it simply says, you know what, I woke up, I had breakfast, went to work, had lunch, I came home, had dinner, played with the kid, and then I went to bed, and I did the same thing the next day. If that is the only thing to the story, thank you very much, but that really doesn't entertain me at all. If it's going to be entertaining, there has to be that them that somehow interacts with the us. Us versus them. And so I want to kind of just introduce you to a concept, to an idea here today that talks about that because we're wired, we are, gone, we, we are somehow we're made with that us versus them idea because sometimes it needs to be us versus them. 
You remember in Joshua chapter 24? Such a great, great chapter. One that really speaks to us and one that Joshua is, is kind of giving his summary thoughts to the people here. He's kind of summing everything up and it's in Joshua 24, 15. Do you remember that? When he talks to them, you go ahead and choose who you want to follow right now. We're in the promised land. You go ahead and make your own decision. But what does he say? As for me and my house, tell me. We will serve the Lord. Do you hear the us versus them? You go ahead and choose, but I'm choosing this side. This is the us. We will serve the Lord. You can go ahead and be the them if you want to, but this is the us of this Hebrew people, the Jew versus the Gentile. We like that idea. But what does outlandish faith do to that expectation? If we live in an us versus them kind of world, what does faith do to that? Well, James has something to say to us about that idea. He has something to help us understand a little bit more that while, yes, there are times it is us versus them, there's something about the gospel that erases those boundaries. There's something about the Bible, about the, this wonderful truth of Jesus Christ that moves us to places we wouldn't normally go. So open up your Bible to James chapter 2. Go ahead and stand with me, please, as we read from God's Word, James chapter 2, and we're going to go ahead and begin in verse 1. James chapter, I'm reading from the NIV today. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated against yourselves, discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, your sin and, your sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he said, do not commit adultery. Also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank you. May be seated. So in our time left today, we're going to just go ahead and look at that idea and consider that uh, 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 the, the, the principle about favoritism and partiality that James is doing. And we're going to use a little bit of geometry. Everybody go, yay! We're going to talk about a little bit of geometry this morning because we're going to talk about circles and lines. We're going to talk about those things that exclude, those things that include. We're going to go ahead and talk about the idea that there are lines. Lines that are drawn that says, it's us, draw the line, and it's them. And there are some times that we need to be able to do that. There are times we need lines that we call borders or walls or fences. There are times when we need to be able to say that this is my property. We're privileged. We have a sprinkler system for our yard. It is a glorious, wonderful thing. Every month we get this amazing bill from the city of Mustang that we have to pay because of that. And we say thank you every single time. As those sprinkler heads are set in the lawn, 
Do you know that they are set precisely so no drop of my water is going to fall on my neighbor's piece of property? I am not paying for his lawn to be watered. I'm paying for mine. There is a line there. It is mine and that is his. It's okay when it's my property, but what about when it is my life? There are times when people of faith need to draw lines. But have you noticed how sometimes it's the lines that get the attention? It's the ways we define ourselves by who we are not that make the headlines? Without going into too much detail, this week was the Southern Baptist Convention held in Indianapolis. They drew some lines in Indianapolis, folks. Some, maybe they needed to be drawn. I, I wasn't there, so I can't really just give a whole lot of commentary about it. it was, it's, I think this was my first time in nine years that I've not been at the Southern Baptist Convention. I kind of took a denominational fast, and it's kind of nice, just to be honest with you. Do you notice that what the newspapers reported were the lines that Southern Baptists had drawn? The things that said, this far and no father, you know? This idea that says that this is where we're drawing the line. And, and again, on some of those issues, maybe so, I'm not, not trying to, to stir up any kind of controversy, anything like that. I'm just saying that's the way it is. And there are times when our faith calls us to say that above all, these things are important and we will not abandon them. The authority of Scripture, the supremacy of Christ, the sanctity of life, those things that we're going to say, listen, we, we want to work as much as we can, but the bottom line is we will stay a people of the Word of God. We will stay a people who proclaim that there's only one name for salvation, and his name is Jesus Christ. Well, we, that's a line we draw. However, Jesus came, and the exciting thing about the gospel, Jesus said, it's not simply the lines. But now, because of grace, we get to draw circles. We get to find out who gets to be a part we get to reach around and say maybe it is not us versus them, but it is all of us included. James says don't show partiality. Don't draw a line between the rich man and the poor man. Don't make that a point of distinction. Don't make that a point of how you're going to treat someone is whether they're wearing nice clothes or not. Instead, he is calling us, draw a circle. Draw something that we'll be able to embrace rather than to be able to push away. Amen. The gospel helps us understand that we get to draw circles. So to help us define that, and again, it, there are times, yes, when we need to be the people who draw the line in the sand. Yes. Oh. <sighs> But might the church be able to come to a realization that's not our first obligation. That's not our very first response to a world that is dead and dying and going to hell. Let's find out what it's like to draw circles. James says one of the first ways to draw this circle is to include who God includes. To include those who God includes. When I was a little boy, talking about my father, great man, loved him, uh, uh, passed away many, many years ago. Uh, I remember there was a little boy. I mean, I couldn't have been more than four or five. I remember my dad had this red kind of shirt. And I remember the day that I got a red shirt. And I remember dad and I both wearing our red shirts when we went to the lake one day. You know, the life of a four-year-old is pretty sweet. I get to wear and look like my dad, and it was a great day. Do you realize as simple children of God 
that there's something of our faith that draws our hearts to look like our Heavenly Father. That something about us reminds others about Him. We want to wear His clothes. You know what I'm talking about there? And it means that His priorities become our priorities. And the things that are important to Him are important to us. It means that we include those that God includes. So if this idea of the world somehow is a circle, if the idea of what God is included is this circle, how do we draw that circle? How do we include the ones that God has included? Notice in James chapter 2, verse 4, he says, have that attitude in you, have that perspective, have that desire in you to wear the same color shirt that your heavenly Father is. Go ahead and don't make distinctions among yourselves that God has not made. So I want you to do something for me. And, and I, this isn't just a mental thing. This is going to be something you actually do. I want you to, to pivot your head around, and I want you to look at everybody in this room. Right now. Go ahead. Just look around. Okay, so you catch them in the eye. That's uncomfortable. It'll be okay. You look around the room, and this is a pretty nice circle, isn't it? I mean, it's family. It's people that you gather with at least once a week, many of you more times than that. Many of you have laughed together, you have cried together. You have supported each other through difficult times, and you have rejoiced with each other at times of celebration. You are family. It is a great circle. And so we include one another in this great circle. God has included us together, right? I mean, God is the one who has said, He's the one who's proclaimed in Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you hear the circle in that? All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the thing that we have in common, because you know what? There are some of us that come football season, we're going to be, some will be cheering for the crimson and cream, some will be, call, be cheering for the orange and black. You know what I mean? I mean, there are going to be times we disagree. There are going to be times when we're not looking at the same things. We don't hold the same priorities. Same thing. But the one thing, Two Lakes, that every single person who is a member of our congregation has professed is they have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He is the one, the stack pole around which we gather. That is a circle that comes to us. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Say that with me. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. You like this room, don't you? But imagine those who are not in the room right now. What about somebody who has said a harsh word to you and your feelings have gotten hurt? Read it with me. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, okay, no, no, no. I'm going to say a phrase, and then you're going to read the scripture with me, okay? What about those who have said a harsh word to us? Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. God's included them. Have you? What about those who live a different lifestyle than you do? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be be saved. In Jesus Christ, there is grace and there is power. God's drawn the circle, have you? What about those who have a different color of skin than you do? Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What about those who speak a different language than you do? Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What about that single mom with two kids that lives a block away from this church? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you have the courage to draw a circle today? Because if we're not careful, we will be happy with who we are right now, and the circle becomes nothing but a curved line. 
But God calls us to include those who He has included. And if they profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, it is not us versus them. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the goal then becomes, how can they call upon the Lord so that they might be part of this great inclusion that God has provided. Do you have the courage to draw a circle today? Now, James talks about who, when a rich man comes, you sit him down in a great place. Poor man comes, you kind of put him off in a corner. We don't have anybody standing guard at the door right now that is trying to say, okay, oh, well, okay, you get one of the good seats. No, 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 you're over here. You know, trying to keep the riffraff away. We, no, 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 there's none of that. Of course not. We don't actively discriminate. But what about passively? Do they feel, whoever they are, that they can walk through the doors and find love and acceptance and grace? Or have somehow, do they have the impression in their minds that they are not welcome here? They are not part of the circle. James gets hard, doesn't he? <laughs> James challenges us a little bit. We're going to include those who God includes. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We're also going to care for those who God cares for. Every once in a while, I've had the privilege of teaching or preaching a systematic theology class. It's uh, where you kind of just go through different doctrines and see how they apply to our lives, what Scripture has to say. And at the heart of that, the thing that makes it all possible, the thing that makes theology something real for us, is the truth, the doctrine that God loves us. If we didn't have that, if he was merely a God who is out there watching and waiting to see what happens, if he's just a God that really doesn't care, if he's a God that really has other things to do, if God doesn't love us, we have no way to know him. We have no way to know any other aspect of theology unless God cares enough for us to let us know. Without God's love, we're in a pretty sad state as it is. But God does love us. And you say amen to that right now. God does care about his creation. God, it's not just inclusion because, well, that's just the right thing to do. It includes because he cares about us. He chose us, it says in James chapter 2, verse 5. That he's the one who has made that distinct, excuse me, he's made that distinction for us. Did, did God not choose the poor, he says. God has chosen them to be part of the circle. Why don't we? I don't know if you've had this experience at all, but inevitably I look back on my childhood and one of the most traumatic things was my physical education classes I had to take. They were traumatic. They were awful. You know why? Because the coach says, today we're going to play kickball. Billy, you're going to be a captain, and, and Howard, you're going to be a captain. They would start choosing. Guess who, beyond a shadow of a doubt, every single time was chosen last to be? Yeah. And I came to a realization that I can't even use that phrase. I was not chosen last. I was just the one that the team got stuck with because they couldn't say no to me. I was on there out of obligation, not because they thought I had any real worth to the team. And by the way, when it comes to playing kickball, they were exactly right. I wouldn't want me on the team, much less. When it comes to God choosing you, He didn't choose you because he had to. He didn't choose you because somebody made him. He didn't choose you because, well, that's just the thing we do. I guess we'll go ahead and take him. No, 
He chose you because He loves you. And when we start looking at those who are out there, when we start considering the unlovelies in our life, does anybody have someone in their life that is difficult to love? Do not answer that out loud. (laughs) It's easy to love people who are easy to love. But what about those who don't look like us? who don't sound like us, who don't talk like us, and not to get too earthy, but they might not even smell like us. Are we going to be a people of God who, like God Himself, love despite their unloveliness? Jesus was talking about that in Matthew chapter 25. He gives us this great picture of separating and and of the uh, sheep and the goats and all those other kind of things. But in the process, he talks about, about people taking care of other people about people going and visiting those who are sick, about going and you know, clothes for those who, who are, are not clothed, food for those who are hungry. He talks about those wonderful ministries of care and compassion. And he says to those who took care of, the, of all, all these who are in such dire need, He says, come, I'm proud of you, you did well. And he said, Lord, when did we do that? We don't remember doing all that stuff. And and, and when do we take care of you like that? And he says, if you have done this to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. If you've taken care of them, you have loved me. You look at the unlovelies in the world. You look at the unlovelies in our neighborhood. You look at the unlovelies you work with. You look at the unlovelies in your family. They are loved by God. And if they call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. That is enough for a circle to be drawn. But it's uncomfortable because they are unlovely. And using our words, not God's words necessarily. But God calls us to it. James calls us to that amazing point where we break beyond the thing that is comfortable for us and we go ahead and draw that circle that includes the unlovely. And by the way, two legs. Just, I think it's, it's one of the occupational hazards for a pastor is that it's all, God said this, you're not doing it, go do that. You know, I mean, that's a pretty standard preaching plan. I've been impressed with you. We places always for us to be a better people of God. But just what you're going to be doing in vacation Bible school in a week or two, you're reaching out to people that aren't here. I mean, you really are. You're trying to draw a circle in people who aren't part of the circle right now. And who knows what little boy or little girl is going to hear about a Jesus who loves them. And all of a sudden, they front and center find themselves embraced by the circle of the family of God. You draw circles. I think we can do better. I think together we're going to figure that out in days to come. Sometimes... Circles, it means including what God includes. It means loving like God loves. And it means paying the price that God paid. Circles come with a cost, friend. This we be real on. It's easy to draw a line. Us versus them. But if we're going to do the business of God, the one that James calls us to, it means that we're going, like, like he said in verse 13, it means that we are going to practice mercy because it, it gives victory over judgment. Do you realize that's what's put Jesus on the cross? He didn't go there because he had to. He didn't go there because it was something that you know, was, he was obligated to. He loved you and he died for you on that cross because God wanted you in the circle. And the only way you could come into his circle was without sin. And the only way that you could get rid of your sin, that it could be expunged, that it could be made clean, was through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Only through Him, only through Him, do we find ourselves in the circle of God. God gives us an analogy of that. He gives us an example, a great picture of that. And in Romans 12, 
Paul tells us that we need to be sacrifices as well, but living sacrifices. We need to be a life that exemplifies the cross, a life that is willing to give up, a life that is willing to let go, a life that is saying, as James said, we love our neighbor like ourself. We practice mercy, a real faith, an outlandish faith. And it means maybe Sundays look different for me so that our doors can be open to them. Hmm. Maybe our schedule looks different so that they can be a part of the schedule. Maybe the things we hear, maybe the things we see are getting in the way of them hearing and seeing God. And I am willing to pay the price of my discomfort if it means they get to come to the circle. That's hard. It's easy to say from the pulpit on a Sunday morning when I'm looking at a bunch of people amen to me all over the place, okay? It's even harder on Monday when they cut me off in traffic. It's even harder on Tuesday when I read about them in the headlines. It's even harder when they come knocking at my door. It's even harder when they hurt, and they hurt me. Okay. Jesus never said the Christian life was going to be easy. Matter of fact, if you you really take Jesus as his word, there is nothing harder than the Christian life. There's nothing with any greater reward. There's nothing with any greater worth. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's tough. Two Lakes Baptist Church. Are you going to do the tough work? It's a great question. Are you willing to draw circles instead of lines? Are you willing to sacrifice? So purposefully, as I was putting this sermon into into notes, I didn't write this part of it. Oh, I kind of mentioned a little bit that is moving to an invitation now. Because I didn't want to script something that maybe God's going to do. We've talked a lot about the church. We've talked about our convention. We've talked about all those other kind of things. And yes, those are real things that continue to need to be part of our prayers. But I'm wondering about you today. Has somebody been laid on your heart that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with church or organization community or politics or any world issues or things but I'm talking your life right now has God brought someone to mind that there's a line and you know that God's in the process of erasing that line and somehow wanting to draw a circle between you and that individual. Do you know what I'm talking about? That person's name is on your heart right now. And it means you need to take action, friend. Just to be real honest. To avoid what God is telling you right now is avoiding the voice of God. And that is another way to describe sin and unrighteousness. So I'm just leaving it to you right now. Time to do a little bit of work with the eraser and a little bit of work to do with the compass. You know? How's God leading you today? Lines or circles? Lord, thank you for our time today. And Lord, thank you for the day that brings us to a point of hearing your word tell us about your love, about your inclusion, about your sacrifice, Lord. Thank you. Father, today might we exemplify that. Might we show that. Might we display that to a world that needs to come in. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This invitation time is yours. How you respond. Let's stand. Oh uh-huh.
you take a moment and just bow your heads right now? This is a piano place. We're not going to sing anymore. We're not, this is, isn't necessarily an extension of the altar call, though certainly this altar is open for you if you need it right now. But I just want you to be quiet before the Lord. And just listen. Is there business today? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Isn't it a joy to be in God's house today? Amen. Thank you, baby. Seated, Linda, I think you have a word for us today. <coughs> While she's up here, <coughs> this thing on, you turn it off? Hello, testing one, two. In just a minute, she's going to give us a report, uh, but we also have some gifts for our fathers. Uh, Brother Dave has a printer at home that he can engrave stuff, and while our ushers come, yeah, come on up, um, you guys. Uh, he went ahead and engraved Psalms 1 and 2 lakes on one side of these. These are magnetic bookmarkers, so our ushers are going to come through here, and they're going to hand one out to all of the dads. And then we also have just a simple... Thank you on one side and a compass on the other, so you can always find your way back to Two Lakes. Just For the men, yes, to begin with, yes. While, while Jim, come on up. Jim gave me an idea a little bit later. He, Delinda's going to talk first, and then Jim will. Come on. Uh, he gave me an idea about um, not just the women, but a man might want to talk about one of, uh, about their dad as well. And Jim's given me the the impression that he wants to talk about his dad. You going to come? While you, while you do your part, while he walks up here. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm Linda Brazell. I have the privilege of being part of the Pastor Research uh, Committee. And first of all, I want to thank God for sending Brother Dave to us to help us through this Amen. trying but exciting times that we have. Um, we are actively searching for a new pastor, but we have work to do before we can get to that point. But I thank you guys for all your prayers and your support during this time. We love you and we praise you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, we just love you so much and we praise you and we thank you for this Two Lakes family. Father God, we just ask that your will be done for each and every one of us here and that we always seek you before we do any, uh, make any decisions of any kind. Father God, we praise you and we love you in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I don't know, I guess we talk about fathers, but we started doing some research on my father. And the more we researched, the more amazed we got. I found out that my father was the first FFA president of Ohio State. He was the first, first vice president of the national FFA and actually organized the FFA nationally in Kansas City in 1929. He was a presidential advisor to Harry Truman and to uh, Eisenhower. He sponsored eight chapters of FFA, started three Qantas clubs, Indiana, Illinois, and in California. He is an odd hobby old buy blue and gold sausage. Well, I talked to the guy from Blue and Gold Sausage well, well, several years ago. He said, when I was in Kansas City one time, he said, I was talking to an old boy about what do all these kids do with all their livestock that don't win the county fair or the state fair? And he says, I talked to this old boy that had been in, Kawada, in the FFA a long time, and he says, I bought a butcher shop and we butcher all the animals for these FFA kids, and we package it and let them sell it, pay for their butcher cost, 
and to help raise money. So I said, I said, really? He said, what's the guy's name? He said, his name was L. L. Augustine. I said, really? The blue gold from here in Oklahoma is responsible from my dad's idea to the guy in Jones, Oklahoma, of what to do with these animals. I mean, the more we looked at my dad, I thought, amazing. He wasn't the guy that welded the belt all the time that we thought about. He raised us all, and he all taught us, do what is right, always give your best, and always be honest and give your best. Thank you, Jim. We got some awesome husbands and fathers here, and apparently I'm just a scoundrel. <laughs> so we'll see about that. Anything else from anybody else? Yes. I just wanted to remind everybody, too, uh, this month is uh, Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. And nobody ever talks about it because it got pushed away by the other thing. I just wanted to make Thank you for reminding us. This is me Mental Health Month. Anything else? You guys, stand and let me pray us out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you do for us. Spirit, you are here. You have descended upon us. We have shared. We have laughed. We have loved. We have learned. And we have been reminded about you, the greatest father that there ever can be because of the sacrifice you made. May we live up to that. May we do our best to be the candle to those around us, always putting on your armor that you give us. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. And it is in your holy and great name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, you are dismissed. If you prayed that prayer this morning to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then please contact us here. Uh, at Two Lakes Baptist Church so we can pray for you and so we can uh, maybe send you some information to help you grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our contact information is on the screen. You can call us, you can write us, uh, you can email us, or if you would like to become a media member or donate to our church, you can go to our website at twolakesbaptist.church. And you can find more out, uh, information out about our church. And uh, we just want to be in contact with you. We want you to know that we care for you and love you. So until next time, may God bless you and keep you and give you peace.